Thanks a lot for having me. I'm really embarrassed of not being able to do this in French, so I'm sorry to do it in English. I'm really, really embarrassed about having to talk about the city today just 15 minutes before Saskia Sassen. This is one of the most embarrassing things I've ever done, and I'm really tempted to give my 14 minutes to Saskia, but anyway, I'm already here. Uh, I'm going to talk today basically about information in cities and the role that information plays in cities, and how can we read cities through the information they generate. Also, because in the last few years, we've gotten way, way better than we used to be at this. In the last five years or so, we've gotten like a new pair of glasses, a new ways of looking at things that have always been in the city, but that now are in some way traceable, are visible, can be represented. And if we had to start this in somewhere at some moment, it could be in Rome in 2006, in a very special day in the history of the city, the day of the World Cup final, where Italy and France uh, played this match, and here, uh, a group from MIT, Sensible City Lab, led by Carlo Ratti, show how the city behave, not through the eyes of showing people in the city, but showing their activity in cell phone networks. And here you can see literally how people react to the events in the match through conversations, and how they react the day after uh, Italy wins and brings the cup back home, and the cup is displayed through the city in a parade. Uh, and it's really fascinating, and a lot of people suddenly realize that through technology, now we have these tools that would show us in a different way how the city reacts to things that happen in the city, and what does this tell us about who, how we use cities. Uh, in the world of uh, design critic John Thakara, uh, these kind of tools are what he calls macroscopes. And a macroscope is basically a way of taking a multitude of uh, individual actions, aggregate them, and showing them together. This is a project that we did in a, a media lab uh, that I worked uh, with in Madrid called Media Lab Prado. This is Madrid, and what you're seeing is the flows of traffic in the city. Basically, how many cars uh, go through every street at any given moment. This is data that cities pick up because they need it, but it's data that usually wasn't being communicated before. Uh, and when this project started, it just started because the designer wanted to, ask, to answer the question, how many cars pass under my window every day? And what it ended up showing in this sort of iceberg-like kind of strategy is how the city is segmented, how it's broken by this element, like traffic flows. Um, in a way, we've gotten better at this because we have started embedding information gathering mechanisms everywhere. And for instance, we have started replacing bicycles, your individual bicycle that you take every day to work, by public uh, networks of bicycles, like the ones that we have here. Uh, we are changing how a system operates, and by creating this kind of infrastructure, uh, we're getting something. We're getting the possibility of taking a bike in one point of the city and dropping it somewhere else and not, uh, caring, so and not caring about it. But we're also giving something to the network, and what we're giving to it is data. Uh, the data that somebody pick a specific bike on one point of the city and drop it on another one. And if you add this data through uh, thousands of different interactions, you end up with things like this. You end up with these maps of activity that in a way tells you how do people uh, use the city device. Uh, I only have 14 minutes, so obviously this is a gross generalization. It, it will have to be something like certain people at certain moments through certain infrastructures. But anyway. And this tells stories, obviously. This is my city, Barcelona, and this is the data coming from uh, the bi public bicycle network. Uh, it's a project done by a researcher called Fabian Giardin. Uh, and basically here what you say is something actually quite uh, evident and daily, the fact that people like to go to the beach on Sunday mornings uh, during the summer, uh, which we all know, actually. But here there is some kind of way of seeing how this process uh, becomes uh, something that has a specific impact in the data and in the way that the ne network shapes that model of activity. Uh, and the gates of some of these methodologies open are not only uh, showing a specific landscape, but also enabling specific conversations. Uh, by revealing the existence of systems uh, that portray the evolution of a specific uh, systems in the city, we can have conversations about their importance. And sometimes they're really key there are really key things about our experience of the city. This is another project that we did at Midlife Prado, it's called In the Air. 
and it was taking data from a very sensitive infrastructure that every city has, every modern city has to have, which is uh, pollution sensing networks. These are the stations that measure the pollution that by law have to measure the presence of five to six different components in the air. Um, basically here, uh, we received one year of data from Madrid at five minute intervals, and we were able to build this sort of diary of one year of pollution in the city of Madrid. And obviously, uh, at least this was interesting for us for two reasons. One was so that we could make questions and try to have a conversation about what does it mean having a big sta football stadium in the center of a city? What does it mean if you're allergic or you have asthma, that you live in one neighbor or the other? But the second thing that is more important even so is that the process of deciding what is measured, where stations are located, what access do we have to the information, what can we do with it, uh, is an extremely political uh, agent. And in the end, shows how decisions are taken on top of this information every day, daily, in every city. This set of tools, this set of languages have started to create something that for somebody uh, can be recognized as the aspiration, the dream of the vision of what is progressively being called the smart city. And the smart city would be the city where uh, decision uh, makers have at their availability constant uh, real-time information about the state of the systems that are operating in the city and will allow them to take decisions on the spot so that uh, we close the circle of feedback between producing information, gathering it, taking a decision, and keeping different systems in the city operating. And, and obviously it's a very tempting image. It's something that uh, sounds great on paper. Uh, we're going back to Rio de Janeiro. This is the operation center that IBM, one of the biggest information uh, technology companies in the world, has built for the city of Rio. And basically what they've done is build this sort of uh, dashboard for the city. It's really the, the notion or the idea that as a major, as a decision taker, you can have a direct hands-on uh, control with how every system that a city needs to operate, electrical networks, water supplies, traffic regulation, uh, can be taken, uh, how this information can be received, and how we can, at the you know, flip of a button, take an instant decision on that, and also uh, do forecasting about how the city is going to evolve. So, obviously, this model and these notions are full of good intentions, of good intentions, but they, they are also highly problematic for different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that, as we were saying before, data is political, which means that in the end you take decisions based on the data that are as good as the data that you have. And data never is this objective thing coming from the sky, something that is embedded in political decisions, in technological uh, processes. Uh, in the end, uh, the dream of modeling a city is very tempting, but it's also very dangerous. Uh, and there is a second problem with this model, which is that it's incredibly top-down. Uh, it really shows the image of a small group of decision takers who are sitting there throwing si signals down to the city and acting on key decisions uh, based on the objective information that they receive from uh, information gathering technologies. But it's actually a very poor uh, model for gathering information in a completely different way, which is based on what people actually want or need, how are people, people on the spot experiencing the outcomes of that information. It's quite in a way impermeable to the real information uh, gatherers of the city, which is people. So uh, we need to think about other visions and other alternatives in which information, data gathering, and data production are going to help us to shape the city. Uh, Anthony Townsend from the Institute of the Future has this notion of a planet of civic laboratories, which basically is offering data, offering information in a way that citizens can use it to hold what you could almost call day-to-day -day impromptu experiments on the city, to be developers, to be actors, and to be able to try, to not to make this huge decision-taking infrastructure that are going to be almost sacred. Uh, and this is made possible by the increasingly availability of things like, for instance, municipal open data. Uh, progressively, more and more cities all over the world are creating websites where they give direct access to the city that the, uh, to the data that the city gathers from uh, the real-time state of their transportation networks to their uh, inflows of traffic uh, in and out of the city to their uh, supply chains so that people 
uh, who actually are paying for this data, <laughs> can get this data back and build on top of it new things. Because uh, one important maxim is that, uh, as somebody said, some of the most important things that uh, can be done with your data is things that you will never think about, that other people will think about. So some big cities in the world are actually have started to give it a, a step forward to let people do things with their data. This is the big apps competition by the New York City uh, municipal government, which proposed uh, uh, scenarios of things that you could do. Uh, and more and more citizens are being called to have an active uh, role. In England, my society built this really important project, uh, Fix My Street, uh, where citizens can be the active agents that can tell the city that a lamppost in a corner doesn't work or that a street needs more cleaning. Gathering, adjoining data gathering by personal observation with a system that will process this information and send it to decision uh, makers uh, more easily. Or even parallel information infrastructures completely run by citizens, which I find fascinating. This is rodalias.info. Uh, this is a system that works in, in Catalonia, in Spain, where basically citizens have organized themselves to build a parallel, through using Twitter, information system about the state of the rail network. Because by being constantly forced to change their plans because of delays of, uh, uh, and relying on a network that doesn't provide enough agile and fast and, uh, and actual information, uh, they found that with a very easy mechanism, they can tell each other how the network, the rail network is behaving at this specific moment. So here you have this fascinating image of one official channel providing information and one citizen run uh, channel that actually reacts many times faster. And also it's full of little stories of how people use it, not just to tell if a train is going to come late, but also if they made this fascinating person on the train that day. Uh, Systems like this one, Schooloscope, uh, recently deceased, sadly, this is a long story, which basically done by Berg, a, a British studio, that basically uh, let parents know the state of the schools in the district through the official data that had to be uh, gathered in things like uh, student performance, teacher performance, cultural diversity, and take all these huge data sets and super threatening uh, Excel files and turn them into an interface that can be a translation in a way. Uh, in the end, really, it's about focusing, and I think this is very important, in ways that we understand that uh, good cities are cities that are very much alive, and, and we can work with that. And, uh, and I'm saying this because uh, if we're going to talk about cities of the future, 10 years ago we had a, a, a vision of the this city of the future that was completely different, and it was a very dead city. Actually, we've been really great at building dead cities. Uh, the housing uh, uh, boom created a lot of artificial cities that right now are actually uh, empty places where no one wants to live. Uh, so it's still hard to think about what a city made of information is going to behave and be like. But, and I wanted to end with this, it's not going to be a predictive city. It's not going to be necessarily a city that, re uh, that answers to one specific model. It's going to be the city that through information gathering, uh, coordination, and active uh, participation uh, is going to be shaped in a very different way. And this is already happening in a way that decision takers and uh, politicians maybe don't like or don't expect. Uh, I cannot forget that in my own country, 40 people one day sit down after a demonstration and said that because they were not happy with the state of things, they were not going to leave. And they opened a Twitter account that was called Acampada Sol and said, we just camp, we were not leaving. And these are these 40 people, and in literally three days, literally three days, these 40 people uh, who posted this first message was this. <laughs> and these people were not only demonstrating, which was very interesting, were creating a city, were reclaiming that city. So that this was not an event. This was, and also this, as soon as it started spreading to other cities, this was a place. This was actually a city within a city, with a library, with child uh, caring centers, with restaurants, uh, with a very specific strate strategy to do that. And after this, basically through information gathering and coordination mechanisms, they started splitting the city in areas and made each of them a, almost a parallel government, where they decided that here in this part of the city you could talk about culture, here about education, here about health. Uh, and obviously, it was done through a strong contestation of a space. It wasn't done just asking and everybody being happy about it. It was through a 
quite traumatic process, but it ended up being this huge, this amazing process by which people reclaim space and thought that it couldn't be active in this. Uh, I am amazed every time that I see this image. This is 3 a.m. in the morning. This is one of the big central avenues in Madrid, and this is people who decided to sit down to talk about decisions that needed to be taken. This is the image that I would like to finish with. Thank you.